Final Fantasy games are well known for having challenging boss encounters, and they range from intense one-on-one -on -one bouts against rival warriors through to toppling fantastic beasts. The majority of these encounters reward the player with items, story progression, or a sense of accomplishment, but occasionally the player could come across a boss that wasn't meant to be beaten. Prominent examples have to be the encounter against the Black Knights at the beginning of Final Fantasy II or those against Beatrix in Final Fantasy IX. They stand as a testament to the strength of the enemy, not the player. And the game will only progress once the party suffers an inevitable and often humiliating defeat. But not all of these unwinnable fights are actually unwinnable. There are very rare occasions where the player is led to believe they cannot overcome the obstacle that stands before them, but with enough knowledge and determination, it is possible to triumph against these insurmountable odds. In this video, we are going to cover seven of those very fights, bosses that appear unwinnable at first, but with enough diligence can still be beaten. As per usual, we are only going to cover one boss per game, and we're going to start off with one of the most shocking fights to ever grace a Final Fantasy game, Feral Chaos from Dissidia Duodecim. Dissidia's final boss, Chaos, was notoriously difficult, even after leveling and acquiring the correct equipment. Chaos thrashed around like a madman with huge attacks like Demon's Dance and Brink of Delusion, and it was quite an achievement to finally win. So when Dissidia Duodecim was released in 2011, and an even stronger version of Chaos was unveiled, it came as quite the shock. Even more shocking was the way in which Feral Chaos was introduced. At the very start of the game, Mog innocently asked the player how experienced they were with Dissidia. If they said they'd played it before, then a tutorial would commence that introduced Duodecim's new mechanics. After this, Mog returned to ask the player if they considered themselves a master of Dissidia, goading their arrogance. If the player had the audacity to say yes, they were thrown into combat with a near full strength Feral Chaos while only being given control of a level 1 Lightning as punishment for their hubris. With over 125,000 HP and the ability to take Lightning out at any time with an even bigger onslaught of attacks than his previous version, this fight against Feral Chaos was designed to put the player in their place, and upon losing, the game would progress as normal. However, as this fight still followed the rules of regular Dissidia play, it was possible to build up bravery and deal HP damage as you normally would, and with enough patience and skill, it meant it was possible to gradually whittle away at Feral Chaos's HP while dodging everything he had, and eventually best him. And what was the reward for beating Feral Chaos so early on, the hardest challenge Dissidia has ever presented? Unfortunately, not much at all. The same cutscene, warning the player for their overconfidence, still played out as if they had lost the fight. All the player had to show for their determination in this case was the ability to say they'd done it, and have a different entry point into the story, as they were placed outside the final gateway with that same level 1 lightning. As the King of Dragons, Bahamut is no stranger to a battle with the player party, having squared off against them in many different Final Fantasy games. And in the majority of these encounters, beating Bahamut results in obtaining him as a usable summon, allowing the player to utilise his destructive abilities such as Mega Flare. However, the encounter in Final Fantasy III was a little different to most. And this remained true whether playing the original Famicom version, the 3D remake, or the recent Pixel Remaster, as players encountered Bahamut twice throughout the course of the game. Bahamut was seen when he snatched the party as they climbed Dragon's Peak in Canaan, and he subsequently dropped them into his nest, ready to feed them to his children. This was where the party met Desh, who had been prepared as food for the dragonlings, and together they deigned to escape their fate. But Bahamut had other plans, standing directly in the party's path, ready to fight for his food. Doing battle with Bahamut this early on in the game was a futile practice, with the King of Dragons able to wipe the party with ease. But unlike many other unwinnable boss fights, being defeated by Bahamut actually resulted in a game over screen rather than continuing the game. This meant the only option left available was to run. 
but some players of the original Famicom version in Japan felt slighted by the idea that they were being told they couldn't defeat Bahamut, and so they endeavoured to find a way to overcome this insurmountable task. With over 60,000 HP and the ability to regenerate all of his HP after any action taken, the only way to defeat Bahamut was therefore through bugs found within the game that either allowed characters to deal capped damage through dual wielding, taking Bahamut out before he could act, or even utilising the white mage to heal Bahamut in a way that overflowed HP, though this particular method was heavily reliant on luck and very difficult to pull off. It stands as a testament to the fan base that these methods were even found, but due to their extreme nature, the developers didn't actually account for such an eventuality, and this meant defeating Bahamut via these methods resulted in the same outcome as if the party had just run away in the first place. The Dollet mission that sparked the events of Final Fantasy VIII was memorable for many reasons, not least of which the boss fights found within. Biggs and Wedge provided a comedic factor to the otherwise serious mission, and as they were blown away by Elveret, players learnt about the ability to draw summons from the boss by finding Siren junctioned to the winged monstrosity. However, the events that followed the fights atop the communications tower were where we found our unwinnable boss fight. After Selfie relayed orders to the party that all seed candidates were to evacuate the town within 30 minutes, they found themselves ambushed by a spider-like robot, XATM092, otherwise known as the Black Widow. The fight with the Black Widow was quite unique, in that the player had to deal enough damage to the machine in order to cripple it, so as to give them the opportunity to run away and extract on time. After a period, XATM092 then repaired itself and continued its pursuit of the party, forcing additional encounters should it catch up and the more the party had to face the boss, the more time was wasted, affecting the seed rank players were given once the mission was complete. Due to its ability to self-repair, XATM092 seemed invincible, but it was actually possible to defeat the boss, and the developers even had a proper plan in place should that scenario happen. After the boss lost 20% of its HP, it fell into a slump and began to repair itself, giving the opportunity for the player to run away. But after the initial encounter, it could only perform this feat up to five times before its self-repair protocol failed. This meant that in order to destroy XATM092 completely, the player needed to take 20% of its max HP away five times, and then take out its total HP once the self-repair failed. This was a challenging endeavour but very possible with liberal use of thunder spells, to which it was weak, and limit breaks, which could be manipulated by leaving party members on low HP. Defeating the spider earned the player 50 AP, a huge amount for this point in the game, as well as a powerful summon junction item that granted their summons greater stats. It also granted additional points towards the seed exam, giving the player a high starting point and pay grade as a seed. But as XATM092 was no longer a threat by the time the party reached the beach, Quistis no longer needed to use the Gatling gun, and it meant the legendary FMV sequence was cut should this scenario play out. Episode Duskai was a demo for Final Fantasy XV that was released alongside Final Fantasy Type-0 in March 2015, and it showcased an early build of the game long before its release in the following year. It featured a story that was exclusive to the demo, in which Noctis and his friends had to raise enough money to fix their car. Episode Duskai had players therefore exploring the Dusko region to hunt for clues on how they could raise the money, and they found a bounty for a behemoth blind in one eye called Deadeye. After finding Deadeye in a ruin, the party tried to defeat the vicious enemy through stealthy means, but this tactic ultimately failed, and the party was forced to run away from the beast with their tail between their legs. It was, however, possible to enact revenge against Deadeye and earn the 25,000 gil bounty. There were numerous side quests in Episode Duskai that explored the region, and they enabled Noctis to gain relic weapons, which later become known as the Royal Arms. These then granted access to the armor durability, as well as gaining the favor of Ramu. Ramu in particular was an extraordinary asset in the fight against Deadeye, as summoning him could destroy the monster in a single hit. 
Now much like in the final game, summoning Ramu took some patience as he was most likely to show up when the party was in grave danger. This therefore took some careful navigation as it made the fight quite perilous. But once Ramu arrived, Deadeye was obliterated, leaving behind his horn as proof. This could then be traded in to earn the gill needed to give to Cindy and bring about the end of the demo. World of Final Fantasy is well known for its more approachable nature, with adorable versions of flagship monsters able to be tamed as mirages and a whimsical presentation showcasing familiar characters in fun and comedic ways. But right at the start of World of Final Fantasy, during the prologue, Ren and Lan discovered a phenomenon known as the Merc Rift. Pocket dimensions which house powerful mirages, Merc Rifts weren't meant to be challenged until much later in the game. But in this instance, the party's curiosity got the better of them. This first Merc Rift contained a behemoth, which often appeared as a late game encounter. But here, one stared the party down. Understandably, the party was nowhere near strong enough at this point to defeat the behemoth and the game continued after they received a pasting. This was all a scripted in-game tutorial, but it was possible to get revenge. The player just had to wait until New Game Plus before tackling this challenge again. Another option revolved around farming enough money to acquire Phoenix Downs to keep the party alive. Poison Fangs were then necessary to inflict the poison status condition onto the enemy, gradually grinding down its HP low enough to enter the KO range. In fact, the trigger for the Behemoth to be imprisoned and captured for the party's use was simply to reduce its HP by a significant amount, which meant that through this method it was actually very possible to capture the Behemoth much earlier than intended. This then granted an extremely powerful mirage that maintained strong stats and abilities throughout the entire game. Final Fantasy XII has a hefty reputation for boss battles with challenging aspects to their fights, such as the gargantuan amount of HP that Yzmat had, or the onslaught of attacks brought forth by the group of judges at the end of Trial Mode. But there is a fight significantly earlier in the game that the player was not supposed to win. Bagamnan, the Bangar bounty hunter, had kidnapped Penelo as a way of getting to his rival Balthea, and he had taken Penelo to the Lusu mines to coax Balthea out into a place where they could ambush him. When the party arrived with Lamont accompanying them, Bagamnan revealed that he had already let Penelo go and proceeded to set his gang on Balthea, prompting him to warn everyone that they would not be able to take on the whole gang and should simply run to avoid conflict. Despite this warning, the player could choose to face off against Bagamnan and his siblings, and unlike some of the other bosses on this list, they weren't massively overtuned, making it very possible to simply ignore Balthier's advice and tackle them head on. The highest level amongst the Bangar in this encounter was 12, which wasn't much higher than where the player should be at this point in the game, and the Lusu Mines provided an easy grinding spot with Lamont in the party thanks to infinite potions so it didn't take a huge amount of effort to defeat the gang if the player chose to, despite the narrative of the game painting a very different picture. The easiest way to deal with a gang was to run back into the halls of the mines and hide behind the wall leading to the next area. This prompted Bagamnan's group to be stuck on the other side of the wall until the player moved into their line of sight. From here, items like arrow and water motes could be used to pick off each of the Bangar individually and by defeating Bagamnan, or everyone else but him, he would simply run away, leaving the mines able to be explored once again. Now, Final Fantasy VI's bosses are some of the most iconic in the franchise. The Phantom Train, Ultros, and of course Kefka make up some of the series' best, but none of these are unwinnable fights. There is, however, one boss that caused quite the problem, as there were multiple unwinnable encounters. After Kefka took control of the Warring Triad and spread devastation across the world, Terra retreated to the town of Moblitz to care for all the orphaned children left after the disaster. But soon after, the demon Humbaba attacked the town, pushing her to take action and fight. Ordinarily, Humbaba could not be defeated in the initial encounter by Terra alone, and the player was expected to lose in order to progress, with Humbaba being fought a further three times before he eventually fell. But thanks to a particular combination of spells, an exploit of the game's mechanics could be employed to defeat Humbaba in that very first encounter. 
In earlier versions of Final Fantasy VI, the invisible status inflicted through the spell Vanish made the inflicted character immune to all physical damage but removed resistance to magical attacks completely, making it so spells that wouldn't ordinarily be able to hit suddenly worked without a problem. Vanish was intended as a positive status condition to be used on party members to avoid physical damage, but due to this unintended side effect, it was possible to use it on enemies to open up vulnerabilities to magic attacks like Doom. Using this combination of spells on Humbaba would indeed cause the undefeatable boss to be defeated, but the game would progress as normal, acting as if Terra had lost. The PlayStation 1 version of Final Fantasy VI tried to address this by making the Vanish spell miss against Humbaba, but this was easily circumvented by eagle-eyed players once the other party members arrived through the use of the Law Skill Rippler, which exchanged the statuses afflicted on the user with those of the target. All this meant was that while the first fight did remain unwinnable, as the Law spells were exclusive to Strago, it was still possible to use the Vanish Doom combo on Humbaba and most other bosses as well. This bug though was fixed in the Game Boy Advance version and all the subsequent releases of Final Fantasy VI by making an enemy immune to instant death, also immune to Vanish and Doom. But the infamy of this exploit continues to this day. And they were seven unwinnable boss fights you could actually beat if you were diligent enough. Be sure to let us know in the comments below which of these you've managed to defeat. And of course, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, the Livestream, Juan Haro Mio, Justin Dent and Zukun TDK, who are super special Ungani supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.